Well, we are finally live with a, a series of monthly roundtable discussions from ASI. My name is Leora Levy, and I, will, I work for ASI, and I will be your host and moderator for these sessions. Together with SOMS and ASI partners from all over the world, we will explore a wide range of different topics each month. Following a challenging 2020, we here at ASI have declared 2021 as the year of the sommelier. We want to hear your voices, see your faces, and learn how individuals and communities you are shaping the sommelier industry going forward. Today's subjects uh, revolved around how ASI SOMs bring their skills outside the restaurants. So retail, social media, agents, consultings, etc. We've asked our top sommeliers how they are creating businesses outside of the restaurant door. And we would love for all of you who are watching to engage in the common field on Facebook. What do you think about the concept? Is there anything you want to hear about in the future? And please do ask questions for our sommeliers here today. Uh, make sure you uh, add who you want to ask the question to, and you can ask it in French, Spanish, or English. We have um, Caroline Leblanc at our back end here from ASI who speaks all those languages, and she will feed us with your questions that we will answer at the end of the session. So welcome to these remarkable Psalms. We have Julie Dupont from France, living in Ireland. Hi, Julie. We have Pascaline Le Pelletier from France, living in New York. Raymond's from Latvia, living in Latvia. And Marie von Am, who is a representative of ASI's gold partner, Wine Alley and a Psalm, They're from Denmark, but living in Barcelona. So welcome to all of you. Uh, great to have you with us today. Each of these panelists have recently launched a project that stems from the core responsibilities of a sommelier. Yet each one explores a different level of the industry chain, education, creation, expansion. But the best would be for these panelists to briefly introduce themselves and their project in their own words. So let's kick off with our very own Julie Dupont Young. Thank you very much, Liora. Thank you very much uh, for having me here and uh, for the opportunity to uh, talk a little bit about Som Ninja. So Som Ninja is an educational mobile application which um, came up as an idea in 2019 after I decided that I was going to retire from competition. Uh, it's an, it's, so it's an application on iOS and Android, so on mobile phone. And the idea behind it was to share with people what I had collected as a database of knowledge over my years of training as a candidate. Uh, so it's a map to study. It uh, regroup thousands of cards, question cards and answer cards that I collected in shoe boxes over the years. And more and more it's updated and so on. So technically you can study 15 topics. So it's not only wine, because as we know, somebody nowadays need to know about all the things that wine. So there is tea, coffee, sake, gastronomy. And uh, it's filtered by geographical area, but also by level. So you can study on three different levels of uh, difficulty. You can study randomly, you can choose your topic, and you can also save uh, the question that you don't know to send them to a different file where you can study them later on. So the process uh, was really about uh, trying to recreate how I studied when I was studying myself. So that's in a short brief what some ninja is. <laughs> it sounds super exciting and I love the idea of categorizing, categorizing everything in different subjects and it must have been a lot of fun for you making this uh, all happen, even Do though it takes a lot of yes. work, obviously. Definitely. And do you know what? Uh, I found myself when COVID struck thinking, oh, I'm at home, what am I going to do? But I already had started working on that project in 2019. So when you have over 10,000 cards to type answers and questions, being at home for months is really helpful. <laughs> well, I guess that's one of the benefits of COVID. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Pascaline? Can you tell us a bit about Chapika? 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 Yeah, hi everybody, very happy to be with you today and thanks uh, ASI for the opportunity to this roundtable. I think it's really awesome to get connected like that uh, all over the world. Uh, the better connection, the, the, the better future. So uh, yeah, my, my project is a bit older. Uh, it started in fact in 2016, but it's getting more and more developed and definitely COVID um, made us think a little bit more about how we can expand that. So uh, Chepica is a wine um, that um, as a label, some brand product placement here. Um, 
that uh, I created with a partner uh, and dear friend with a winemaker in the Finger Lakes when I was um, a sommelier in my previous restaurant. Sorry, it's a subway from New York you can hear in the background. Oh. Um, yeah, and um, I was looking to uh, find a wine that was organically certified from New York and I couldn't find it. Uh, there was nothing like that in, in New York um, when I looked for it in 2016. So uh, with my friend and partner, we decided to give it a shot and we, we, we created that wine because there was nothing like that. And that wine um, has a very unique specialty, not only is made with organically certified grapes, but is made with hybrid grapes that are kind of the history and the past of New York. Uh, so we are working with a hundred plus uh, years old vine from grapes that nobody heard about, that is Catoba and Delaware. And by doing so, we wanted to make an econo like economical political statement saying, think about what doesn't really mean to be a low caver and to work with what surrounds you and can be grown in a certain environment. So by doing so, we're able to make a wine with absolutely no additives um, and nothing at all and paying tribute to what used to be New York wine more than 200 years ago. And this little project started with only 100 uh, cases of wine. Um, give it a shot. And uh, now we are going to almost release this year for more than five, 600 cases of wine that we are selling um, in the US, in Canada, in France, and soon to be in Japan. Uh, and it's a kind of a crazy project because I found myself last year at, uh, oh, in 2019, my God, at, at Vinexpo in Bordeaux doing a seminar about the future of winemaking in the US going by hybrids and organically certified wines. So it's a small project uh, that is growing, 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 um, handcrafted. We do everything ourselves, both me and Nathan. Um, and it's been a fascinating project to be on the other side than buying wine, but also now, of course, making wine and selling wine and understanding that. So, chez Pika. That is amazing. Uh, and I love the way you bring the culture, original culture of the US into life with, uh, with actually the thought behind it that you don't have what I want, I'll make it myself. And you're really making yourself into a, to a U.S. citizen <laughs> by integrating all these things. That's that's really great. I'm looking forward to tasting it at some point. What about you, Raimunds? You're still in your own country for the moment, at least. What uh, can you tell us a bit about your project, Wine Teach? Yes. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here as well and uh, to share a little bit about our project. Uh, well, Wine Teach, yeah, the idea was born in uh, 2019 when a good friend of mine who is a wine lover approached me and uh, actually proposed uh, to make this uh, app, online project, because she said that for a wine lover, there is nothing really uh, on the online environment available. So this is how the idea was born. And I said, well, if you can manage uh, and organize all the technical marketing business aspects and uh, I'm allowed to film video content, let's do it. <laughs> because I was extremely busy at, uh, at that time. So yeah, WineTeach is a subscription-based online education platform that enables uh, anyone in the world to learn about wine from the very best and leading sommeliers and wine specialists of the world. And uh, the, the video content is filmed in a very kind of easy to understand way uh, with an entertaining twist and can be uh, something from three minutes about tannins and 30 minutes about Chenin Blanc, uh, depending on the, on the, on the topic. And uh, there is a broad diversity of content, of video content available, starting from practical videos, for example, how to open store and serve wine and also a little bit more complicated topics like viticulture and winemaking. And uh, the content is updated every second week. And I think that the core value of our project are uh, the content creators, which are uh, globally well-known sommeliers and actually colleagues of, of ours. So that's very shortly about the project. It is a, a very interesting project uh, indeed, and I've been lucky and I've seen uh, some of the films you've made, Raymond's, and they're, like you say, they're in such a nice and, and uh, comforting environment, very informal in a way that doesn't really scare people who don't know that much about wine away. So um, it's, uh, I think you've made it into a, making wine into something that's not so scary for many people. And I think that's probably what we want to teach people, so. 
And uh, Marie, you are a sommelier, but you are uh, involved in a very interesting interesting project. And and Wine Alley is ASI is one of ASI's gold partners. Um, so please tell us a bit more about it because this is something that's very interesting for a lot of psalms out there in the today's situation. I would say. Thank you so much, Leora, and thank you for having me on this amazing initiative from your side. Um, it's really, really great to see things like this happening in, in our really challenged world right now. So, well, Wine Alley was really started out from a vision of combining great food with great wine and make people first and foremost to feel secure in their choices. Not only when they were in a top class restaurant with an experienced sum at the table, but in all restaurants, in all wine shops, in all supermarkets in our, what we call the Wine Alley ecosystem. So we knew what we needed to create a cheap, easy to use digital tool where all parts of the wine industry from producers to distributors, restaurants and sums could help themselves by helping everybody else. So by helping others. So what we did was it's basically, Wine Alley is basically a business system for all of these levels of the trade. So for restaurants, for wine merchants, for wine producers, and also for supermarkets. Besides that, it's a web app for consumers. So we launched Wine Alley for wine producers, one of the versions a week ago, and the other four ver versions will be launched uh, on the 24th of February this year. So it's crazy busy time and it's super exciting. Um, so in short, these five different word versions, they all work together to connect all of the different parties in the, um, in the ecosystem, in the trade. So the producers go in, and register the wine information in English, all of the typical stuff you would have in a tech sheet. We made all of these wines digitally accessible for distributors, untrained clients and consumers. And really most importantly here, we make the wine shine by always and everywhere in our wine alley universe. So present the wines in the most favorable way based on the consumer's wine preferences of the day and the chosen dish. So that's the producer part. So wine distributors and merchants can down and upload all wine data that was provided by the producers. They, all this saves time and money on manually handling all of this information by typing in a PDF that you receive in your inbox usually. So when a wine merchant registers their wines in, in their account, then consumers using this web app can get wine and dine recommendations on the wine sold in the shop, or also online, obviously or in the restaurants or in the supermarket where these wines are sold. Um, even on top of this, if a, um, a Horeca client, meaning here restaurant, approves, then the merchant can also have digital access to the restaurant's inventory, um, only see the wines that they have sold to the restaurant given here, which also is really, really saving a lot of time. Um, and um, so if you go to the restaurant version, um, here, Wine Alley really helps by cutting administration costs and increasing revenue, something that we all really need today. Since a lot of customers and, and also just waiters, not speaking about sums here, are feel insecure when, when either buying or recommending wine that matches the food, food, a lot of sales is affected this way. Here, we will simply have revenue increasing by having consumers feel comfortable choosing the right wine to the dish or having a waiter that is not a trained sum again, doing the same using our, uh, using our web app here. It also makes it super, super simple when using Wine Alley to offer wine for takeaway, which I believe we'll come back to a bit later. In a supermarket, it's very simple. Um, it makes it super simple for a consumer to choose the wine that goes well with the food they're gonna be cooking. And for the consumer side here, um, we really, any consumer can use Wine Alley to get the best wine recommendation to a chosen dish based on an occasional wine preference, where they want to purchase the wine, if it's in a restaurant, in a wine shop, in a supermarket, if it's online or if it's in the store. So that's, uh, that's again, a short, a short version of a quite sophisticated and not so simple system. Um, but we believe that it, this is really trying to save time and to really optimize the work of, um, of all different involved parties in the wine trade and, and, and easing communication. And, and giving a new chance for, for sums to, um, to, to do what they do best. Not spend so much time on administration, but really on providing the service that they're educated to. 
Well, uh, I've been lucky enough to uh, get some insight info on Wine Alley uh, through you, Marie. And, and like you say, it is a very sophisticated and quite a complex system, but you are very good at explaining it. And uh, like you say, if someone wants to have more information about this, because it is, uh, I think it can be very interesting for for a lot of uh, uh, restaurants and sommeliers these days, they can always be in touch with Wine Alley. We have... <laughs> we have some some questions uh, for for you today, and I'd like to ask you, Pascaline. Um, Sommelier is a job that doesn't really lend itself well to home office. <laughs> Yet in 2020, with restaurants shuttered around the world, there were there wasn't really much choice. So many of us have had to adapt and, and embrace a new reality. What do you think of the? office of a sommelier um, or what do you think an office of a sommelier will look like in 2021, 2022 or, or 23? Yeah, so I have to say my office, of course, with the lockdown and being confined in New York looked way more than my office used to be like 10 years ago with a desk and books and, and notepads and all that. Um, but I think that's just a temporary moment. Uh, look at all the projects of, of, of Julie Raymond and, and Marie today, I think the office of a sommelier is going to be that more than ever. You just need a phone and you need a good connection. Uh, what's happening more than ever is um, everything is getting really digital. Um, and the access that we currently have with a lot of really creative app, and I'm very excited to hear more about also what, what Marie is doing or, in terms of this interaction about the administrative part is to have people thinking really like knowing what we are talking about and creating all the different technology so we can really carry them with us at any given time um, so we can kind of not lose as much time as we used to on certain tasks so sommelier just being on the floor from data inventory to access to very specific information for tech sheet for new inventions that are coming up i know i'm hearing a, a, about a new app coming soon for wine labeling for ingredients like connecting to one world and things like that means that at the end our job will be less and less on the desk more and more with very specific thoughtful uh, digital tools that will allow us to take away a lot of exhausting data especially the, the the classic text sheet or a certain part even of the reading to have access to a digested piece of information that we can then uh, make our own and where we can we can just like refocus on what really the job is about uh, which is of course service of the customer and creating um, a, a specific relationship from the wine to the people drinking it so i, I really believe um, there will be no desk i think you just need today uh, a smart, good interaction between the different digital tools, because there is just way too many of them today. So knowing which one is a good one from experts that really understand how to build them. So it's why having somebody like Raymond or Julie creating things is very important because they really know what we need and just matching everything like that. So no more desk, unfortunately, or, you know, just uh, just a computer and a phone. Well, I guess uh, most SOMs are not in the business for the desk work anyway, but uh, I agree with you. This is the time for sommeliers to be creative and, and really think about more than what we normally used to think about. What do you think, Raymond? Yeah, I think uh, Pascaline already clearly explained and confirmed also some of my thoughts. But uh, I think we have to accept that more or less COVID will stay with us, which means that there might be uh, more outbreaks again, which will limit our possibilities to work and travel like we used to do that. So of course the online, uh, online uh, as an environment will definitely play an important role uh, in our everyday actions, you know, be it tasting or a lecture, a round table discussion like that, like, like this one here and uh, meetings. Uh, so, Assume, I assume that many sommeliers will be well equipped with lights and microphones and cameras and teleprompters <laughs> uh, to deliver the best uh, digital uh, online quality. But I think uh, just to conclude, uh, the most important thing in my opinion is that we have to accept that these new way of work uh, and accept as the reality actually, because that will help us to move forward and to develop and find the best and the most suitable way how to transmit our passion for wine. 
and sometimes it's really like uh, great to look back how things were and uh, we were lucky to travel and hopefully it will come back but i think uh, we need to look into the future and not uh, stay with our memories about uh, the beautiful past which we had yeah yeah let's keep them uh, sweet memories and then um, look ahead i guess well, um, Julie, in 2020, it pushed a typically conservative, slow to change industry to adapt fast as if it were to survive, basically. Sommeliers, uh, sommeliers obviously were a large part of that. Uh, what aspects of the profession did you find yourself eager to reevaluate? And what do you think the future will look like? Well, you know, Johan, I'm an optimistic person. <laughs> so I actually think that Yes, technically at the moment, you know, a lot of restaurants in the world are closed and sommeliers are not on the floor anymore. But I do believe that a big part of us or somebody still working on the floor will be back working in restaurants uh, as soon as the, you know, the vaccines is rolled out and, and so on. I, I have good hope that things will get better. It might take a few months, but uh, we'll be back to uh, eating in restaurants and, and uh, sharing uh, our passion with somebody and listening to somebody working on the floor. So that's one thing. Personally, I haven't worked on the floor in a few years full time, but I have many friends who did. And I have to say, the industry might be quite slow to move, but people were very quick to react. Uh, some of you find very many creative ways to apply their knowledge to, um, you know, to top up their income or even to, tr to create a transition, uh, to take this opportunity to create a transition to come up with something out to create something new. And for instance, you know, there are so many projects that I've seen, you know, we've seen being born, I mean, on my local market here, but I'm sure it's the same, you know, where you are guys in New York or in Spain or, or in Latvia or so on. You know, we've seen local restaurants who didn't do takeaway, who now are doing takeaway, who took it to a higher end, who actually are offering some of services with it, with wine pairings. Uh, we've seen shops and sommelier uh, doing some partnership creating some mystery box for customers you know to buy monthly or so on uh, we've seen projects such as wine teach with where somebody are moving away from the floor and putting their knowledge to a new digital platform uh, for teaching so i actually think that it's not the end of something but being forced into a corner to rethink how we used to be or how we used to live helped us uh, create the start of something else. So I think we are in, you know, it's a transition. So I'm optimistic. And an exciting one, I would say. Mm, so far, very much a so. A lot of positive things coming out of it. Uh, mm. Like your project also, Maria, what, what do you think about this situation? First, it's so nice to hear positive people and thinking and seeing opportunities and then instead of just seeing <laughs> problems. Um, I actually also think there's some great opportunities for sommeliers here to have a home office, to offer their services to multiple restaurants as a digital sommelier. I mean, we used to having flying winemakers. Now, maybe now we have flying songs <laughs> sitting at home and flying around from their, from their phone, you know? Um, I actually also think that it's very important to really get the true value of the work of the SOM out there. We all know how time consuming and stressful it is to be to be responsible for purchasing multiple suppliers, wine cellar composition, reducing waste, all of this, just to update your wine list every day and help your waiters and train and all of this. Um, and since all of this administration is so difficult to measure, uh, restaurant owners often, if it's a big and commercially driven restaurant, find it really hard to value the real cost of the sum. They look at the, the bottom line, but the real work of the sum is super hard to put a number on. You know, and the only way to save time on administration for the wine industry in a restaurant is the same as in any other industry. It's by digitizing a lot of this work, you know. So when it comes to increasing the revenues, there are some ways to do that instantly. And one of them being takeaway as well. As you just mentioned, you know, one of the really biggest changes the last year is how fine dining takeaway has gone from zero almost to thousands of restaurants. You know, if you go in and look at the Guide Michelin, the Michelin guide, it, there's four and a half thousand restaurants offering takeaway and it increased, you know, exponentially over the last year. You know, it's been naturally boosted by the pandemic, but it was already growing before. So people want to have a great wine and dining experience at home some of the time as well, you know. 
So to be able to offer, to use your summer services and offer a matching wine for takeaway ordered food, it's a great service, you know? And also, again, if you look at the finances, financial part here, the gross margin on a bottle of wine, even at a takeaway price, is, is, is making any food order so much more profitable for a restaurant, you know? Besides that, it's, it's as Julie also said, it's a great way to market the restaurant, not only just for future takeaway orders, but you know, it's, a, it, I mean, if you deliver great food with matching wines, any satisfied customer is much more likely to come back to you as a restaurant once you open and you can actually invite people in or you need catering, you know? I, th I really believe that, that sommeliers and restaurants not only need to, but really should embrace this whole, you know, wine for takeaway as a completely new business opportunity. And, and we see the trade already doing this, but, but I believe it's something we really could focus even more on because it gives the clients a better experience and you make more money, more profit. I totally agree. And I think that uh, even though the pandemic has been disastrous and very sad, it has really raised awareness in many, many different areas and people have uh, in a way blossomed uh, in other areas, which is, is really inspiring and great to see. And uh, well, there has been some, there's been a lot of, well, major touchstones in the hospitality uh, in the past decades. Uh, education has been one of them. And Raimonds, um, you've, well, Raimonds and Julie, both, both of you, have created business focused on educating education using a digital platform, albeit with different ends, end users in mind. Do you think the idea of top sums uh, divulging their answers and training methods is new? And do you think sommeliers are educators or as educators via various digital platforms is one of the future roles of the modern sommelier, Raymond's? Yeah, great question. Actually, before this roundtable discussion, I had a wonderful Zoom chat almost for two hours uh, with, uh, with a sommelier from Argentina, but based in Spain. And actually, I was doing exactly the thing you are asking. I was sharing my experience and how, how to plan for a competition. Because, you know, with so many professionals globally, there are always new things we can learn from each other, actually, and also share with other professionals and also wine lovers, of course. Uh, things like techniques, approach, how to learn, how to study, how to taste, how to prepare for competitions. There are so many angles. Uh, and ways how to do that. So I believe that, you know, uh, sharing your experience, you know, uh, is, is, is the right way to do. Uh, and it, uh, when it comes to wine lovers, actually, I'm 100% uh, sure that, of course, depending on the market, but uh, I would say for wine lover, uh, the majority of our skills and theoretical knowledge, experience, tasting approach is something new and exciting uh, to discover. So um, for me, for example, um, I will look in some ninja, you know, when I will be preparing for my next competition. And it's a great app, as, uh, as Julie mentioned, where you can test yourself, improve yourself, you know, look for gaps in your theoretical knowledge. Maybe you have missed something. And then in, in case of wine teach, for example, you have one platform uh, which unites, unites uh, a bunch of some of the best sommeliers of the world, which are speaking in a very easy, entertaining language about uh, several uh, topics of the wine world, which is more maybe tempting and, and attractive for, for a wine lover with a basic or a good basic theoretical knowledge. So uh, I think it's, it's, it's a wonderful way how to share uh, our expertise and, and knowledge. And to answer just very shortly the second part of the question, yes, uh, digital platform will be the future environment for sharing our expertise. And this example, like uh, with, uh, with my conversation uh, with, uh, with the sommelier from Argentina, actually, you know, she's based in a different continent well, not in this case, as I mentioned, she's based in Spain, but through digital environment, uh, you can easily share your kind of experience and, uh, and explain how to do, how to plan things better when someone is, uh, for example, preparing for a competition. So um, I think, yeah, that's, that's definitely the future. 
I agree. And I also think that having so many different sommeliers everywhere, everyone's bound to have their take on, on how to share their knowledge. And, and that might fit some people and not others. And that's why it's great to have so many. What do you think, Julie? Um, well, I think Raymond's covered a lot of it, but I, I think you asked um, if it's something new about divulging your, you know, your knowledge and uh, sharing your expertise. I don't think it's new. Um, I think, you know, sommelier being a sommelier is really about, it, it's a passion to start with. Uh, we all know the amount of work that goes in us, the amount of hours we spend working as a sommelier. I mean, this is, you know, coming from real passion when you're preparing for a competition, especially when you go to interna international competition, you know, it's borderline becoming an obsession or if you're preparing for an mayor of Ouvrier de France, like Pascal did, I mean, that's, you know, reaching some, some levels of knowledge, which are incredible. And it's, this is not something you want to keep for yourself. That's something that I think this passion you want to share after a while when you decide, okay, I'm done, I'm, I'm retiring or so on. And I think somebody, I've always done it. Um, I've been very lucky to, to, you know, to ask for advice in the past uh, to, you know, very talented um, and very um, knowledgeable somebody. But the thing is you had to travel. It, it wasn't, you didn't take a, a call. You were not, okay, let's have a phone call. That, you know, that didn't work like this. You needed to see the person face to face. You had to take a flight. You had to take, you know, take your car and drive if you were leaving maybe mainland Europe or so on. So it was more bespoke. It was a one-to-one. -one. I think what um, digital platform are going to allow, it's really more an opening of knowledge, which are going to be, which is going to be spread and shared uh, more easily. And probably also it will be accessible, more accessible for a lesser price than it used to be. If you think about having to cross over, you know, to cross through the planet to go and meet somebody for a couple of hours spent for, you know, some advice or a couple of days. I think this is really going to, um, I'm, I'm not sure what the word is, but make one education more accessible. Um, that's that's what digital platform are going to, to allow. Well, uh, I, I completely agree with you, Julie. And um, I, I also just wanted to take the opportunity to ask you out there if there are any questions that you would like to ask the panelists, please um, don't hesitate to, to ask your questions um, either in the comment field or as a, a direct message on, on Facebook to us. Um, make sure you direct the question to the person you would like to ask the question to. You can ask in French, Spanish, English, or even German, actually. So um, we have one more question here. And uh, Marie, um, in an earlier question, you, post, uh, you uh, posted a fascinating idea. You said, are the days of the flying winemakers over? Has the time for the digital sommelier begun? Could you explain what you meant in this quickly challenging landscape or changing landscape? How can sommeliers prepare themselves to embrace the digital tools at our disposal? Thank you. It's a great question. Um, so when we launch Minerly now on the 24th of February, it is a way for SOMS to offer their services digitally to all restaurants subscribing to the system here. I mean, being a digital SOM means that you do everything that a SOM usually do, except serving in the dining room. You do it from your home office. <laughs> so all other tasks are digitized and, and thereby not so time consuming. And we can, you know, dedicate our time to what we are best at and what we are driven by, except, you know, attending wine tastings, <laughs> doing great wine and food pairings, the things we, 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 we love. And most SOMs decided to become so out, out from a passion for wine, not a passion for sitting and, and, and managing a stock. You know, it's it's really, you know, <laughs> that that's that's the digital summary, you know, and, and being responsible for as a purchaser, as a song purchase for five, 10, maybe 15, 20 restaurants instead of just one, also strengthens your relationship with um, between the song and the wine suppliers, you know? And even then, if you take it one step further, these volume discounts leads to better purchase prices when again strengthens the value of the song for the restaurant because you get better prices you have a bigger purchasing power so you know um and i also believe that being a digital song it naturally costs less than employing a full-time song working on the floor which then now it makes it possible for a much larger number of restaurants to afford the services of a sommelier 
Um, so, you know, we even decided that, that all of the restaurants that subscribe to our system here, they can request further sommelier services. And we will pass this on to all SOMs that apply as a wine alley ambassador. So we're trying to sort of <laughs> systemize all of this work of a digital SOM, you know, everybody that wants to apply for ambassadorship can, can do so and we will help SOMs generate revenue on being digital SOMs. And, and by this helping much more restaurants offering a better dine and wine experience to their clients. Well, I think it's a, it's a, an exciting a new concept with a digital SOM. Do you have a take on this, uh, Pascaline? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a tricky one too because I think um, the, the the kind of the the big risk on just also going free digital is to find to kind of lose a DNA. What does that mean to a one-on-one -on -one relationship that is very personable? Um, and um, I think this is also one of the reasons why people are coming to specific restaurants and when the sommelier also took such a, an evolution over the years is because there was this evolution in education and suddenly a focus put on wine, but because there is an individual on the restaurant able to connect on a one-on-one -on -one to have that very specific personable relationship to the clients that not a lot of people on the dining room, but at least knowing the American market can give to the client, make people coming back because they knew that there was this very curated attention to details. And I think the thing with digital makes it a little bit trickier is to really understand uh, on one side your clients, uh, which is not the, the same thing when you are conversing through um, uh, digital data or numbers or trying to understand exactly what the person wants and how he wants it. Um, and catering to the best offer you can do. I think this is something that when you are just trained on the floor, you need to learn and it's a learning curve. You can't just improvise yourself overnight as somebody that is able to handle that through a new system of relationship with the clients. I think it's easier when you have a background as a corporate wine director, for example, this is a kind of an organization you can do because you learn how to deal with at distance uh, giving an information, understanding the, the logistic of an organization and all that. But if you are just moving yourself from one single unit restaurant to something larger than that, um, there is a little bit of, uh, yes, once again, learning curve. Is the future probably, and I think the ones that are going to win out of that are the best people, the best families are going to be able to really shine through, will be the one that will be able to recreate that extraordinary personable relationship with something that is different from anybody else, uh, from the other people in the market, because we need to be facing it. We are a lot of people today trying to become a digital sommelier. So what makes you different? Is it just going to be your ability to convey your message through externally savvy, techy, digital uh, tricks and tools, your mastering of Zoom, your ability to convey some um, I don't know, bringing some winemaker at the same time when you are teaching, like being creative on that side, or it will be exactly the knowledge that you want to give, and as well as the logistical part. Are you going to be able to ma master uh, organizing properly what your clients want? So suddenly, I think all of us, we have all the skills, but is how to expand that on a world scale with a lot of different culture, with a lot of different logistic, and for that, um, it's, it's not going to be that easy, but if you are able to do so and with the right partner, and I think Raymond touched on something very, very important, it's good to do it by yourself, but more than ever, I think, um, because the competition is so hard, you need to have multiple, multiple skills around you. And I think more than ever, you are not going to be alone. I think you need to have a couple of people surrounding you and helping you to really get the best product out there from somebody maybe helping you on the website, the design, the digital, just technical part on that and one on the logistical part on that. And this is what I learned over the last year because I've been doing that not on an obvious scale, it was more like on, with, with a lot of things more in the background with the restaurant, um, to kind of keep the DNA of what I was doing on the floor. So it was a, a personal concierge sommelier service, uh, but we dedicated that to very specific clients of the restaurant, not to the overall world because I was not ready to be able to give what I would be able to give on the floor at a larger scale. We started small and little, and now we are growing and making more things national in the US. But, but I, I also help myself with other talented people to help me on the logistics side and on the digital side, because I was not the one savvy for that. So what Raymond was saying, we but, know we need uh, to know what is our core. But what a what a wonderful way to keep engaging with your with your guests, Pascaline, uh, in your restaurant. That is that's amazing to 
to kind of take the restaurant out of the restaurant setting and and persuade or, or pursue your your guests to actually be able to kind of enjoy a restaurant feel even if they can't come to your restaurant it's i think that's a great uh, great service to give to your guests um i think it's also a very fine line between the digital some and the regular some on the floor and we must never lose ourselves in the fact that we want to talk to people and have people react back uh, somehow, not only on the screen, but there will always be uh, a time where we won't be able to interact with people face to face. So I think this is a great option then. We've um, challenged our panelists to each come up with a question to one of the other Psalms. So why don't you start, Julie? I have a question for Pascaline. So my question, Pascaline, to you is, um, do you see your project as a one-off winemaking venture? Uh, because we are all aware that uh, you have a real passion for the Chenin Blanc grape variety. So I'm wondering if you might have any future plans to be involved in other wine regions or perhaps to work with other grape varieties? That's, that's a good question. Um, so one thing I learned with a project is you do it extraordinarily well all the way through or you just don't do it. Um, Chepika has been successful so far and we're very happy with it because we kept it to a, a certain size and there is a certain organization to make sure that what we are doing is unique and everything I'm, we are putting out is to the utter highest standard of quality. Uh, according to us, with a very, very strong ethos on how we are making the wine. And one of the reasons we didn't explode it because we, we are sold out in a day when we are putting the wine out. So we could have really developed a lot, much more the production, but we decided to keep it to a certain size to really be 100% in control and financially in control. We don't have any external investor, so we are the only one. We are deciding 100% of what we are doing and we are controlling exactly the quality of what we are putting out. Um, we have all been traveling the world and we know what that means to be a winemaker. <laughs> and um, I have no pretension here with that project. I have Nathan doing it with me and it's a kind of a whimsical project. The day I will decide to do a, probably a wine and a Shona, that's for sure it's something down the road I'm dreaming about. Uh, I need to make sure that the condition are 100% what I want for that project. And in that case, I really want to make a, a, a wine the way I want to make a wine. It really means that I need to be by the vineyard and I need to be really taking care of that vineyard all year long. And I have such an idea of the one I want to make that I won't do it until I get the right condition to do it the right way. And I think this is something that I've been learning and probably you did too, is like we have so many offers, so many potential partnerships, so many people coming to us let's do that. Let's do that. I think learning how to say no and to understand what when is the right time with the right uh, amount of control, of legal ability, of making sure you have the um, enough time just to do it well is absolutely crucial. So until I get that, I won't. But it doesn't mean that I don't plant the seed yet. <laughs> I Thank you. Bring it. And project, <laughs> as you all know, takes some time. Nice. Have you taste your wines from New York? It was lovely, really enjoyed it. So I'm looking forward to the Chenin Blanc now. I'm Thank looking you. forward to tasting these too. Pascaline, you have a question for Raymond, do you? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, um, we, we all know how complicated it is to, um, to create a business and to run it. And especially when you start to have a team and when you start to also work with people from multiple continents and from all over and on top of that, having another job and on top of that, having a family. So um, I want to know from you, Raymond, because you, you, you manage successfully to, to do everything, competition, restaurant, family, new business. Can you give us some tricks or tools uh, to be able to really be as efficient as possible? Or how are you handling all that without, without losing the, the fact that you need to take care of your, of, of your kids, your family, look, making the time to do everything? How do you how do, you do that? How, do you have any tricks for us? Because I would love to know them. Thank you. I would wonder what my wife would say in this moment. <laughs> Uh, but <laughs> yeah, uh, I would say 
uh, I would say it's a combination of, uh, first of all, time management, planning, which I'm not very good at, and setting priorities. Um, and then we, we need to understand that, as you mentioned, there is a borderline uh, because at one moment, uh, if it is too much, then you lose the quality of what you are doing, be it family, work, communication with your colleagues, etc. And of course, as a person, you are exhausted. So you need to find this balance. And as you mentioned, um, sometimes you have to say no, not only sometimes, but uh, in order to, to not lose the quality. So when you are getting, for example, ready for competitions or when you are starting a new project like we did in 2019, you need to find a way how to actually prolong your day. And uh, one of the easiest way is probably to start your day earlier. And this is exactly what I did when I prepared for competitions. I, uh, I woke up at, uh, at six o'clock and then before actually my, 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 my everyday work began at nine o'clock, then I had these three hours when the rest of the family was sleeping uh, and I was able to study. And, 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 and learn. But then, of course, you need to try to at least to finish your day earlier in order to get a good sleep, because without a good sleep, uh, you are not able to function uh, efficient, you know, in whatever you do. Is it studying or maybe uh, leading a business or guiding a wine tasting? Um, when I used to work in a restaurant and manage a restaurant, I, those were the days when I was able to travel a lot and uh, of course to manage your daily work operations uh, the only answer is you have to have a good uh, and motivated team so there is someone back in the restaurant or whatever your business is uh, to manage all the all the necessary things of course email phone calls um, everyday updates with your with your colleagues uh, that's that's a basic kind of uh, thing to do in our case, we also had a wonderful online reservation system uh, where I was able in any moment from my phone to check what's happening in the restaurant, how many reservations, do we have some VIPs coming in and etc. And also uh, the next day you can get the report uh, on, on, on business wise, you know, uh, what was uh, how many guests there were, what was the income and etc. And uh, now with the new project, of course, uh, which is Wine Teach, which is uh, strongly linked to, to, to the online platform and technical aspects, which is, which is really something like new for me. Uh, of course, we, we are a team of six people and everyone has his uh, own responsibilities. And I'm really bad in technologies and numbers, but I love to do the um, artistic part of the project, with, which is uh, filming content. And of course, uh, of course, I have many contacts of, of great sommeliers, uh, which I was in contact and uh, proposed to become part of our, our project as a content creator. So yeah, it's not easy, but I think the most important thing is to set priorities, to find the balance in your life between family, kids, happy wife, job, colleagues, etc. It's not easy. It's not easy. Uh, sometimes it's really, really challenging. And then I think also it's important to decide if you want to do something new. Uh, it's, it's a family decision because in the end of the day, family is the most important thing in our life. But what we do and how busy we are, how, uh, how often we travel, um, in the end of the day, we do that for our family and kids uh, as well. Uh, so just to be more or less very short. Uh, on your question, Pascaline. Well, I think it's a challenge for for not uh, not only people with a family, but a lot of people who have uh, a lot of things uh, uh, or projects going at the same time to distribute their time correctly. Um, yeah. And but Raymond's, you have a question for Marie. Yes, I have. I, I just remembered one important thing, very quick one. Uh, I remember uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, gave a really good tip, actually, which is linked to Pascaline's question. How do you manage all these things, you know? Uh, 
And uh, the guy who asked said, I, I need at least eight hours of sleep to be efficient in the next day. And, and Arnold said, well, just sleep faster, he said. <laughs> and well, it's difficult to sleep faster, but uh, you can manage and plan your day in order you get your sleep. So coming back to my question, actually, to Marie, and uh, I think it's, 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 it's a really exciting and also uh, complex project uh, which you are involved in. But I was really interested in this wine and food, uh, wine and food uh, matching system. And for us sommeliers, uh, it is a very uh, important part of our, of our profession, of our craft. So I wanted to ask if you could give us a, a short insight actually on how this uh, app will work and help consumers and more specifically wine lovers to choose a suitable wine with their food uh, in different situations of their everyday life. Absolutely, and thank you so much for asking this question. I know it, it, it all seems super complex, but, but once you get to know the whole thing a little bit better, it's, um, it's, not, that, it's not that tricky. So we, we basically want to make it simple and comfortable to purchase the perfect wine for all consumers, be it in a wine shop, in a restaurant, or in a supermarket. So basically what you would do as a consumer, you take your phone, open Wine Alley, you decide where to use Wine Alley, restaurant, wine shop, a supermarket, you click restaurant. Then the next screen will tell you take away or dine in. You do take away, for example. Then you have a list of restaurants. You can have your favorites or you can just go by, um, by geotech. So you would have restaurants around you or you search for them here. Then you choose that restaurant. Now we want to order takeaway. So the restaurant has all of the menu, their entire menu up. You go in and say, I want to have the oysters uh, with vinaigrette for a starter. Then I want the um, entrecote to go super traditional here. And my wife wants this and then blah, blah, blah. So you choose the dishes from the menu and then you say match wine. Here it will take match the dishes you chose with all of the wines from that restaurant list. Now you can add your own preferences. So if you, I feel like drinking a Chiron Blanc today, or I can only be between 50 and 70 euros or something. So you can filter with your own preferences it, at any given moment. We are not using AI because we want people to be able to have a choice every time. We don't want people to always drink the same thing. <laughs> so you will put in your preferences on, on every occasion and it will come up with a list of wines that is matched um, with the dishes that you chose with a suitability factor with a percentage. So it will always have the, the out of there are 10 wines that matches with the highest suitability on top. And if there are several wines with the same suitability, it will always list the wines with the highest gross margin on top. Again, trying to help the restaurant each in choice here of making more money on this. Now, if you come to the point of how this algorithm was developed, it's actually <laughs> two of some really high level ASI sums, Arvid Rosengren and Son Polonius, that has helped us and are checking that this actually works. Because we need, we cannot take over, we cannot digitalize being a SOM. So we've had to rely on some of the greatest people of the trade to help us develop this. Again, I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to take, I don't want to make a digital sommelier. I want to help sommeliers get their knowledge out there. So this is another way of doing it. Um, in this algorithm here, also the dishes, when you type in your dish as a chef or a restaurant manager, you need to score them on different factors. So uh, not only cuisine, but also acidity, hotness, fatness, all of this. So all of the dishes will be given a DNA and the same all of the wines have in our database. It has been taking years to develop this system here, but then the algorithm basically matches a wine DNA with a food DNA. And there are more than 54, I think, billion combinations in this algorithm here. Um, so it's, it's been highly complex and it's definitely not something we did from one day to the other, but we've also believed that in, that in the world we are in right now, it's, it's a super helpful tool. So, um, I mean, and a lot of people ask us as well, what's the difference to Vivino? And I mean, it's like, you mean, we, we want to offer great wine and dine experiences at the time and at the place chosen by the consumer. We don't sell wine. We help local restaurants and sums and merchants and supermarkets sell their wines in a better way to help consumers. So, 
that was sort of this, the angle from the consumer side. And it's absolutely free for consumers. You know, the, the more we can make this go viral, the more we can have it out there. It's completely free for a consumer once it's launched on yeah, the 24th again for consumers. It's a, it's a food and wine matching tool developed by some of the greatest sums in the world. It's going to be interesting to see how it uh, how it all going to work out when it launches eventually. We have one last question, uh, a final question from Marie to uh, Julie. Yes, I wanted to ask you, Julie, you've been touching this a little bit before, but obviously something you're very sort of into and, and super passionate about. How do you see the whole sort of in a wider scale of wine education changing in a digitalized future that we are in already in, in a digitalized present and, and future, even more so? What, where do you see the whole thing going? Thanks very much for the question, Mary. First of all, I want to say I'm actually very excited to see your app on going live because it sounds like really interesting and I can't wait to start using it hopefully in Ireland. Um, so yes, so thanks for, for the question. How do I sit? What couple of things. First of all, I think um, wine, wine tastings uh, will keep on taking place online. Not all of them, I hope, because I'm really missing going to, you know, tray tastings and uh, but for I think for a while it would still keep on happening and it probably will still happen um, in the future for, for different for various reasons. And it's very funny because this is really the last thing I would have thought was going to be possible. And people came up with those great ideas of, you know, you share bottles, you send smaller samples. So I think this this will keep on happening, which means that, um, that you know, new new vintages uh, will be shown maybe without having to, to travel around like there'll be lots I think going on like this. I think uh, there will be a far broader option of study as well available. So for instance, without naming any, you know, um, schools or anything before you used to register for a course, whether, you know, you had to, whether you had it in your country, so you had to, you can attend in your country or you might have to travel or pass your, you know, exam into another, into another country. And I think because of now all the new online platforms, the fact that classes are online, in most cases, uh, schools are adapting. I think this is opening the option of wine studying to many more students because it's going to cut down the cost of studying again by not having to pay for your flights, not having to book accommodations on top of having to pay for the, the cost of the course. So I think this is great. Uh, to come back as well to uh, sharing information from, you know, sommelier uh, to younger generations or so on. I think the idea of having access to a mentor, a mentor more easily is also something that will become more and more common. I mean, Raymond, uh, I'm sure you've got, as you said, lots of people delighted to be able to contact you and delighted to be able to, you know, listen to your advice and your experience probably same, you know, for you, Pascaline. Um, and in the past, it would have been so, I think, daunting or even stressful to think, oh, I'm going to contact one of the best sommeliers in the world or one of the best sommeliers in Europe and to ask for advice or even to study with them. And this is made possible through digital platforms again and, you know, Zoom meeting or Skype or so on. So I think um, this is how things are adapting and how things are moving. Of course, I in some way much prefer myself dealing with people face to face. But I do think that the fact of now having forced people, the consumers, as, as professional to use those online platforms, we're just being used to it. And it will continue to happen and it will broaden the opportunities for studying and for sharing information. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> it did. Thank you so much. It's super exciting. Mm -hmm. Well, I think all your uh, all your uh, projects are very exciting. We've been running uh, a little bit out of time here. We uh, said we were going to have a little Q and A at the end, and we won't have more time than one question for each each of the panelists, unfortunately. And we need to be a little bit quick about it. And I will ask uh, Marie. The first question um, came in from uh, let's see here. Oh, I can't see who where that came from right now, but. Uh, the question is, how does Wine Alley help consumers in supermarkets make uh, that difficult decision to buy from so many options? So um, if you imagine you're standing in a supermarket or shopping online from a supermarket, most supermarkets have what they call inspirational dishes. Any supermarket, if you look at their you know, weekly news thing, then they would to try to help you guide on, on what to cook, there would be dishes. So we ask the 
supermarkets, instead of a restaurant registering the menu, the supermarket will have registered the inspirational dishes. So when you would be standing in the supermarket or buying online, you would see, oh, what food have I bought? Um, I have bought something to cook this dish. I have bought a piece of filet and some vegetables for making a salad or something like this. So yeah, there you would use the inspirational dishes. And then you would say, I want to pay maximum 15 euros and I feel like a red wine from Spain to sort out. And then it would come with the 10 or 15 suggestions that match that dish. You can also add more dishes if you are sitting and planning, like a lot of us are right now, shopping online. Usually you go in online on Carrefour or whatever it is, you plan the whole week and say on Monday we eat this, on Tuesday we eat that. So you choose those dishes and you choose your wine preferences and you match. Simple. Exciting. That was a good question. To whoever asked me that out there, thank you. (laughs) That was Alex Ferris from Puerto Rico. I found that now. And then we have a question from, well, uh, it's originally from Portugal, but I believe the lady maybe is living in Germany, uh, Karin Petriocio, Petriocio. Uh, to Julie, um, how long did you need to mettre en place, en place, some ninja? And she's also thanking, thanking you a lot for this really cool app. <laughs> Thank you, Karin. Uh, I think Karin is a candidate for the next uh, continental competition in yeah. Europe. Um, uh, well, thank you for the question. It took me, well, the idea of Some Ninja started in the summer of 2019, and we started working on it with a designer and developer at the end of 2019. What took the most time was typing all the questions and all the answers. Um, while the developers were working on all the coding and, and so on. So it took me about 10 months to type or nine months to type all the questions and uh, and answers. And I'm still, you know, adding up to it and working on it and updating uh, answers every day. And there is also a query button, as you know, Karin, on, on, the, on the app. So they are spelling mistakes. It happens. I'm not a robot. So obviously, you know, I've had people reading over it over and over again, but it's still typos or things like that. And people are very good because they send a query, they question, you know, I think there, you know, there is this spelling mistakes. I respond automatically to people, it's personal answers, and I correct everything. And it's of great help to actually have users interacting and, uh, you know, with updates and helping improving the app every day. So, yeah. It's... Thanks, Karin, for the question. <laughs> We have a question from Italy, Andrea Ferrano, uh, to Pascaline on uh, uh, direct matches. Not everyone wants to use the comment field. How is the transition f- or how has the transition from SOM to winemaker been for you? Do you look at wines differently today than you did before? Did you know what you were taking on? That's what he's asking. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, Yes, I knew in his way this project of Chepica is a partnership with the winemaker that is uh, on a field upstate in New York. Um, and that project um, has never been to really think about I'm going to become 100% winemaker. I have way too many respect and understanding for what that means. Uh, and so it comes back to how to make something with the right partner to a certain idea uh, of what we need to do uh, for that little wine that once again at the beginning was supposed just to be for my restaurant and become something way bigger um so um so i I, uh here i'm more a brainstorm and i'm more the kind of the conceptual person behind that why i have somebody extraordinary on the field looking after the grapes making the wine i go for harvest i go like i'm going to go for disgorgement we are working together on which market you want to be in. I'm doing the sales here in New York. Uh, we are going to, as I say, we are going to do something in France. Well, I'm more on that side. And so I'm not going to call myself a winemaker at all in this project. I'm a partner and I have a winemaker working with me. Um, making wine is a whole different ball games, as we all know. Um, but by doing this little project, you know, it's in- incredible because it allowed me not only to go on the other side, knowing what that means to sell wine, to find a distributor to negotiate your cost, so you know, go on on that uh, on that alley. But you also open up a lot of different markets. And by Chepica, uh, indirectly, I could work on 
really showcasing was when my philosophy of one and it attracted a lot of people to my restaurant. So I saw it also as a, I think all the projects that you need to do needs to feed each other. Uh, it's how I'm seeing which project I'm involved in. So a project can't take too much of my time without feeding the other thing I'm doing. And it's a network of, of little center of action that each of them are going to relate to the other one. Um, and I'm seeing that this way. So I'm not losing time dedicating something that has nothing to do with my core things. Everything is linked together. So the question is, how do we feed each project together so everything grows better uh, and with integrity? I still believe what all your project guys are doing, there is a strong DNA with a strong vision of what your perception of wine is and whatever is incarnated into matches so you are not like diffusing and dealing yourself. That's, that's also a big thing. I think that's a healthy way of looking at uh, having different projects, Pascaline, to, to kind of connect them and, and having them all kind of turn into one circle and feeding each other. Um, we have one more who doesn't want to, who wants to be anonymous from Canada uh, with a question from Raimonds. How do you choose to, uh, or prioritize the different themes uh, of your educational video content? Yeah, good question. Um, well, we, we are looking at the global map and uh, we try to select uh, friends and sommeliers, first of all, which are ready to create video content, which uh, of course is a little bit challenging because not everyone is ready to speak in front of the camera. And also it, it, it involves uh, several technical kind of uh, aspects uh, to do that. But basically, yeah, we look at the uh, global map and we try to, of course, with time, uh, we try to cover each continent, each, uh, each region, uh, grape varieties, viticulture, winemaking. And of course, uh, for that is responsible our, uh, uh, our uh, uh, content creators and also uh, the, the whole team, of course which is uh, creating different kind of uh, contexts and also a, a strong, uh, strong kind of uh, link to our platform is also entertainment. So the way how we speak about wine should have an kind of entertaining twist. Uh, so the complicated and uh, complicated topics and information is delivered in a really kind of easy way. And uh, I know that not everyone, everybody is able to do that. Sometimes it's challenging. Uh, so, but basically, yeah, uh, our whole team is responsible for that. And of course, also we ask our content creators uh, what kind of uh, topics they feel comfortable about that and also about what kind of topics they are specifically passionate about. Because every one of us have a good uh, global knowledge of wine, but someone is more specializing in sake, someone is more specializing in natural wines, uh, etc. I love the part when you're talking about tannins in your video, Raimon. So for those of you who are not uh, following Wine Teach, uh, if you want to look up Raimon's uh, tannin, take on tannins. So just a few minutes, but it's a really cool one. I like it. Thank you. Um, so we've actually come to the end of our session here. If you want to know more about our panelists, you can read an in-depth interview with them uh, on ASI's website. So you just log into ASI.info and there you have it on the front page if you scroll down. The webinar will also be put on YouTube in the coming days. So if you didn't catch it from the beginning, you can see it all there. And I just wanted to thank you so much for joining us today, Julie, Pascaline, Raymond and Marie. It's been a great treat for me to host you and for ASI to have you guys on board. And um, we hope you enjoyed it as much as we have. But next month we have, a, or more accurately, the 15th of March at 3 p.m. CET, we are back with a new round of panelists and a new theme to discuss. We will be uh, talking about what defines a sommelier, ASI diploma, um, and we will be putting the winner of the Gerard Basset Lifetime Achievement Award in the spotlight. With us in the panel, we will have both Nina Basset and the legendary Michel Chanton. The award is being announced on Sunday, March the 7th each year, and this will be a great opportunity to know the first winner of the award.
Our panelists, um, apart from the winner of the Gerard Basset Award, will be announced in ASI social media in the coming week. So just make sure you stay tuned. There will be psalms from every corner of the world. So thank you all again for joining us today. And um, hopefully we'll see each other again face to face in 2021. But for now, we'll stay digital, I guess. Thank you all very much. See you.